Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. The year was 2014. On my birthday, I went to an electronics store with my dad. I've been looking at MacBook Airs for a long time at that point, and that day was the day. I had my first MacBook Air, a mid-2013 base model, with 4GB of RAM. It served me really well until I spilled coffee on it three years later. It had a dual core i5 and 4GB of RAM, but it didn't matter. I used countless MacBooks and Windows laptops ever since, but none of them got me excited as much as that MacBook Air. Until today. Meet my new daily driver, the M1 MacBook Air. Today, we actually have two of them. One of them is a base model with 256GB of storage and 7 GPU cores, and the other is the 512GB model with 8 GPU cores. We'll compare one with another, and we'll also compare them with the M1 MacBook Pro. But before we check it out, please consider subscribing to my channel so I can make more videos. Alright, let's start with the box. Is it just me, or are these boxes getting harder and harder to open? Anyways, in the box, you get the MacBook Air, some documentation, a USB-C to USB-C cable, and a tiny 30W USB-C charger. New MacBooks don't come with a cleaning cloth anymore, instead Apple opted to sell them for $25 Canadian dollars. Okay, this chassis has been around for a long time, and it's pretty much the same as the one on the 15-inch and the 16-inch, but I think it fits the Air branding really well. It still has the Air design that gets thinner towards the trackpad. I'm already used to the non-glowing Apple logo, so that's not really a problem for me. The MacBook Air I went for is a space gray. The 16-inch before that was a space gray. The 15-inch before that was also space gray. My girlfriend, on the other hand, went for the gold version, and I swear it's the most beautiful MacBook I've ever seen. As per tradition, you can easily open the lid only with one hand. I could do this with the 16-inch MacBook Pro as well, but it definitely wasn't as easy as this one, despite the 16-inch Pro being heavier. Speaking of heavy, this computer only weighs just above 1.25 kilograms. You can easily carry it with one hand and use the other hand to type on it. This might sound weird, but I do this quite often. When you open the lid, the computer automatically turns on and plays the oh-so-familiar Apple chime. Well, I don't know why people are so obsessed about this, I actually preferred the silent boot. Anyways, it's very unlikely that you'll ever shut down this MacBook, so it shouldn't be a problem. In terms of ports, you get two Thunderbolt 3 ports and a 3.5mm headphone jack. That's it. This used to be a problem 5 years ago, but now that USB-C dongles are so popular and widespread, I have no problem with it. A $40 dongle will get you 3 USB 3 ports, 1 HDMI port, and an SD card reader. There is only one display size for MacBook Airs, 13 inches. It has pretty much the same screen as the M1 MacBook Pro, except that that one has a peak brightness of 500 nits, while this one is capped at 400. It has a resolution of 2560 by 1600 and has true tone. The bezels are quite thick, especially on top. I think it has similar bezels to the 16-inch MacBook Pro, but as this one is smaller, it's more noticeable. The top bezel houses the camera, which is in dire need for an upgrade. It has the same 720p camera that Apple has been using for I don't even know how many years, and considering the fact that most of these will be used as zoom machines, Apple should have gone for a 1080p one. There is obviously no touch bar, but Apple is getting rid of it anyway. What state is the Touch ID sensor, and I'll talk more about it later. The keyboard is supposed to be the same as the one on my MacBook Pro, but from personal experience, I can definitely say that these ones have more travel compared to my MacBook Pro keys. Regardless, typing on this keyboard is not only very easy, but also quite fun. Interestingly, they got rid of keyboard brightness adjustment buttons for dictation and don't disturb. I know that MacBooks adjust the keyboard backlight brightness automatically, but I still liked having them there. The trackpad is one of the components that remain the same, but I really can't blame Apple for that. For years, MacBook trackpads have been vastly superior compared to Windows trackpads. Windows laptops are closing the gap, but it's still not the same. It is somewhat smaller than the trackpad on the 13-inch MacBook Pro, but at least in my opinion, it doesn't affect anything. Force Touch is one of those features that never got popular, but I love it. I loved it on my iPhones too, until Apple took that away from me. As I said earlier, when you open the lid, the computer turns on by itself. And if you're turning it on for the very first time, you'll need to set it up. The whole setup process takes less than 10 minutes, then you're ready to go. I mean, unless you need to update it first. Both the Airs came with Big Sur installed, and the first thing I did was to update them both to Monterey. 
especially when it comes to new pieces of technology like this, is crucial to update it as soon as possible to get as much performance as possible. You could tell that Apple has been working for their in-house computer processor for at least four years. It all started with the T2 security chip. That was a great idea in theory, but in reality, it created yet another layer between the user and the computer. Anytime you needed to put your system password for something, you would need to wait up to 10 seconds for that pop-up to show up. 16-inch MacBook Pros had an issue where the keyboard would lag as long as you were using the integrated processor. They also had problems waking up from sleep, causing a restart. MacBook users suffered for 5 years, but ultimately they got something revolutionary. Using this computer for daily tasks is simply amazing. You never have to wait for anything to load and you absolutely never see that annoying spinning ball. Again, you might be surprised, but those issues were quite common among MacBooks with T2 chips. When I had my old Air, I used Safari as much as possible as it had decent performance and better battery life. I've changed since then and started using Chrome on macOS as well. With this Air, my old habits came back. To be honest, it doesn't matter what browser you're using on this laptop, you won't experience any lags. And I'm not just saying that. I'm not a tab hoarder, but my girlfriend certainly is. She has more than 20 tabs open at any given time and she's never had an issue. When you open the lid, the Air immediately wakes up and starts waiting for you to put your password or use the Touch ID sensor. Alternatively, if you have an Apple Watch, you can use it to unlock your MacBook too. This is a feature that you don't think you need until you start using it. The fact that you don't need to do anything to unlock your computer is simply amazing, especially if you work in an environment where you lock your computer quite often. When the M1 chip first came out, there were some apps that didn't natively support it. Apple was prepared for this though, and they had a very impressive emulator that managed to get those apps to work. They ran a little bit slower than native apps, but they were in no way slow. I tested this firsthand as I tried out an M1 MacBook Pro last December. I'm very happy to report that the new architecture definitely caught on, as among all the apps that I have installed, OneDrive is the only one that doesn't natively support this processor. It still works just fine though. Also, no matter how many apps you have open, it won't warm up. And fans won't get loud either, as it has no fans. I've been writing the script for this video on my Air, and it's a breeze. I usually take a couple days to write a script, as my hands get tired or I simply get bored. This keyboard makes me want to keep typing. This is highly subjective, but the wrist rest length is perfect for me both when I'm sitting at a desk or when I have the laptop on my lap. The function key now doubles as a language switch, just like the one on the iPhones. That is quite useful for me. As I said earlier, it has the same 720p camera that Apple has been using for a very long time. There is finally a 1080p one, but it's only available on the new 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros, as well as the new iMac. Not all hope is lost though. Now that Apple switched to ARM for their Macs, they can finally use the same camera algorithms that they do on their iPhones. The photos you take with it won't be Instagram worthy, but they will be perfectly fine for Zoom and FaceTime calls. This is how I look and sound like when I use the integrated FaceTime webcam and the microphone array. And this is the integrated webcam and the microphone array of my Dell laptop. And for comparison, this is from my iPhone. By the way, if you open Photo Booth and start moving your head around, you'll see the algorithm in action. The biggest downside of the last MacBook Air was the screen, which was already out of date when I bought it in 2014. It was a TN panel with horrible viewing angles and I'm really glad that Apple went for the full retina display for the new Air. Although its maximum brightness is slightly lower than the one on the MacBook Pro, in regular use, I can't see a difference. To be honest, I can't really see a difference between this one and the 16-inch MacBook Pro either, except the screen size. This caters to another main use case of this MacBook, content consumption. Speaking of content consumption, it's speakers. It has a top-firing stereo setup, just like most new MacBooks. On paper, the only difference between the Air and the Pro is high dynamic range. And frankly, I don't know what that means. The speakers go quite loud, not as loud as my 16-inch Pro, but regardless, quite loud. There is absolutely no bass, and I feel like they sound a little bit tinnier compared to the Pros. Regardless, they are still more than serviceable. Then there are the quality of life features that apply to all MacBooks. These are features that you just get used to. 
You have your iMessages as well as your regular messages on your MacBook. You can make FaceTime calls. You have AirDrop. You can copy from your iPhone and paste it onto your MacBook. If you have a Safari tab open on any iDevice, you can easily hand it off to your MacBook. One call the off life feature that the MacBooks don't have is window snapping. Honestly, I find it to be super useful and I don't think I can live without it. Better Touch Tool is a fantastic app that lets you customize many aspects of your MacBook, including the keyboard, the trackpad, and if it applies to you, the touch bar. Moreover, it also has a window snapping feature. If you don't think you need all those features though, you can just install the Better Snap Tool from the Mac App Store. It's a paid app, but it's completely worth it, in my opinion. By the way, the reason why Apple is not offering this as a native feature is that it's patented by Microsoft. I said in the very beginning of the video that this computer makes me feel the same way I did when I got my first MacBook Air. That laptop had an impressive battery life, I even got 13 hours once. Well, this Air out does that. I usually keep my laptop plugged in during the day, but one day I chose not to. I started my day at 10am. I use my laptop as I normally would. I had 6 to 7 tabs open, among which one was YouTube or Netflix. I had a Word document open, I had my mails, I had a couple FaceTime calls, I did a Zoom call once, and at the end of the day, after 12 hours, the battery was at 50%. So I used my computer for 12 hours, and I only consumed 50% of the battery. This use case will represent the use cases of current and prospective MacBook Air users. The battery life on these is unbelievable, and it gets even crazier on the M1 MacBook Pro. You might be impressed by how small the included charger is, but as it's only rated at 30 watts, charging it from 20% to 80% will take a little bit more than 2 hours. If you're a student, you can get the base model M1 MacBook Air for $1169 Canadian dollars. And from what I understand, those sell like hotcakes. For a good reason. Although all MacBook Airs have the M1 processor, the base model is missing a GPU core. I can't tell why Apple chose to do that, but from personal experience, I compared my MacBook Air with my girlfriend's, and in daily use, there is literally zero difference. So don't let that confuse you. What could make a difference a few years down the line is the RAM. Both the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro come with 8GB of RAM by default, and it's not user upgradable. macOS is great at RAM management, and coupled with a super fast SSD, I wouldn't be concerned about it, but if you do have a couple hundred dollars lying around, it would not be the worst idea to invest that in 16GB of RAM. Don't pay for extra storage unless your applications are going to take a lot of space. Now, you might be thinking why one would get the Pro instead of the Air. At the end, they have the same storage, same processor, same RAM, and same screen. First and foremost, the MacBook Air is completely passively cooled, while the MacBook Pro has a fan. This will make a difference if you run long and processor-intensive tasks. If you're in engineering or computer science and you're worried about compiling your code, do keep in mind that most code compiles in a couple seconds. So that's not what I'm talking about. Secondly, battery life. The battery on the Pro is around 16% larger than the one on the Air, and as a result, you get 20 hours of battery life instead of 18. You also get a touch bar if you're into that. Would I get the Pro or the Air? Well, I tried them both and I went for the Air. And I really think you should too. It's lighter than the Pro, it has the same ports as the Pro, it performs really similar, yet it's cheaper. In Apple's current product lineup, I don't think it makes any sense to buy the M1 MacBook Pro right now. You either get the M1 Air or the 14-inch MacBook Pro. If you're considering waiting for the new MacBook Air, I have a feeling that it will be named MacBook. I'm saying this because the M1 is still a very powerful processor, and any performance upgrade beyond this point will result in a price increase. I feel like the Air will stay where it is, but it will be accompanied by the new MacBook, as well as the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros. I really don't think Apple will sell the new MacBook for the same price as the current MacBook Air. I use a wide variety of apps with this Air, so if you have a question about a specific application performance, feel free to leave a comment down below. Overall, just like the old MacBook Air, this one will be sold for years to come. And if you get one, I'm sure it will last you a long time. Unlike the old MacBook Airs, this one doesn't fall behind the MacBook Pro, at least the M1 version. It performs great in daily tasks, and overall it's a great laptop for daily use. This is my first review where I can't find any significant flaws with a product. If you're interested in benchmarks and performance figures, I'll soon upload another video. 
Who knows, maybe it'll be live by the time you watch this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider liking this video, subscribing to my channel, and checking out my other videos. Take care.